All right, so if your dog likes following an actual Bible, um, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 4. And I'd like to just take a second and welcome everybody that's joining us online right now. We love you here, and I'm so glad that you're a part of what we're doing uh, today. Today, I get the opportunity to open the Bible, and I get the opportunity to share from it. I love that. I don't take that lightly at, at, at all. The, the truth of it is, is that anytime we read a scripture, we want to ask two questions. One, what happened? And two, and more importantly, what's happening in me right now because of it? And so today I want to talk to you about Jesus. And, and the reason is, is because it's my first time here. And so no, 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 matter, no matter what our backgrounds are, Jesus is what unites us all. And so Jesus is, I want to recenter us around Jesus. Now, or, or orthodox theology for Christianity, since Christianity was formed, affirms that Jesus was fully divine. That in Christ was the fullness of God bodily. And we affirm that here. Kingdom City affirms that. Shane Willard affirms that. We embrace that. That Jesus was fully God in flesh. And we embrace that. And we honor that. And we believe that wholeheartedly. And I want to give that a full 20 seconds of do. Okay? Because we embrace that. But... Orthodox theology has also said that Jesus was fully human. And in his humanity, it did not violate his divinity. And in his divinity, he did not violate his humanity. And so what I want to do today is I want to spend the entire morning talking about the human side of Jesus. Not at the expense of the divine side, but there's only so much you could say in one talk. Because we believe that Jesus was fully divine. But here's the problem. If we only think of Jesus as divine, then we run the risk of having trouble applying what he told us to do to our lives. It's like this. If I said, come on now. Hey, come on. Hey, seriously. Jesus commands us to forgive our enemies. Well, if we only think of him as God, then we could easily go, yeah, but he was God. That was easy for him to do, right? But wait a minute. No, no, no. Jesus was fully human teaching humans how to live on this earth. And so anytime I preach, I want Jesus to get bigger. I want the cross to work better. I want the resurrection to be central. And I want scriptures to get bigger, not smaller. I want us asking more questions about God, not less questions about God, okay? So this is my goal this morning. I want to talk to you this morning about what it meant to be a disciple of a first century rabbi named Jesus and what that means for us. Jesus humanly was a first century rabbi. Now, how do I know that? I know that because they called him rabbi, okay? And they didn't just call anybody that. That was a special title. Three people in the whole Bible are called rabbi. Jesus, Paul, Gamaliel. That is it. That's it. You never see Rabbi Peter, Rabbi James, Rabbi John. Never, never. Jesus, Paul, Gamaliel. Why? Because to be a rabbi was the highest honor. To be trusted with teaching Torah was the highest honor honor. They just didn't let anybody do that. Jesus was called rabbi for a reason. He was rabbi, right? And he had his basic speaking spot in the temple. They didn't just let any redneck do that, right? And if he showed up in a town with a synagogue, they're flooding him with, hey, rabbi, rabbi, read us the Torah, teach us something. And so I want to talk to you about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, because if I asked you, are you a disciple of Jesus? Everyone here would say yes. And so I want to talk about what that means. So if you could bring up that first slide. This is Matthew chapter 4. This is Rabbi Jesus calling his first four disciples. Here's what it says. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Now, if you're a note taker, you want to note that phrase, they were fishermen. That's going to come back in a little bit. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll send you out to fish for people. Now, quite frankly, that is not a compelling invitation. It's weird. Hey, stop fishing for fish, and I'm going to send you to fish for people. That literally makes no sense, right? And the sales pitch isn't that great either. Follow me. Now, watch what happens. This gets weird. At once, they left their nets and followed him. How did Jesus pull that off? Grown people leaving everything they know to follow a guy whose sales pitch is follow me. How does that even work? Grown people leaving wives, jobs, children, homes, communities, and boats to follow a guy who simply said, follow me. 
You might be thinking, Shane, he was God. They didn't know that. That's first. Second, you don't introduce yourself as God and have credibility, right? There's something else going on here. Like, how does that even work? And then he's remarkably successful with this horrendous sales pitch. Watch, next slide. He goes four for four with it. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. What was Zebedee thinking? His entire workforce just quit with no notice. You've got grown people leaving everything they know. If you're here today and you're married, how does that conversation even go? Hey, honey, how was your day? Quit my job. You did what? Quit my job. Why? This guy came by, told me to follow him. Seemed like a good idea, right? Where are you going? He didn't say. When are you coming back? Didn't say that either. I'm just going to follow him. How would that go? And what possessed grown people to do this? And when I learned this, changed my life. I'd like to share it with you today. For me, this made Jesus bigger for me than ever before. See, to understand this, we have to understand that every Hebrew boy was trained to be a rabbi. Let, Let me show you. He actually goes five for five with this. Check this out. Next slide. This is the fifth disciple. And once again, Jesus went out beside the lake and a large crowd came to him and and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus said. And Levi got up and followed him. First four disciples, fishermen, fifth disciple, tax collector, a guy leaving his lucrative business on the spot because a guy said, follow me. Gotta be something else going on. And there is. See, In the first century, the greatest honor for anybody was to be considered a rabbi. Every Hebrew boy longed to be a rabbi. But at the end of the day, only the best of 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 the best made it. It's sort of like in Perth. How many boys grow up wanting to play AFL? All of them. How many of them are actually ever going to play for the West Coast Eagles? None of them. At some point, everyone's told, I'm sorry, you don't have what it takes to play at the next level. You got to go make a living somewhere else. But the best of 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 the best make it to the West Coast Eagles. That's how it works. That's why every 40 year old man in Perth has a back in the day story, you know, like I'd have made it if it wasn't for my knee, you know, but but we all know you weren't that good. (laughs) It, It was the same way with being a rabbi. Everybody wanted to be. But at the end of the day, only the best of the best of the best of the best of the best made it. And here's how they cut them. Here's how they determined who could be a rabbi and who had to go earn a living at their family trade. First thing you had to do to be a rabbi was you had to memorize Leviticus by age six. So you had to, how many of us are disqualified already? We're done. That's that's us done, right? You had to memorize Leviticus by the age of six. Now, if you memorize Leviticus by the age of six, it qualified you to graduate to the first school. Let me show you the names of these schools. Next slide. So the two schools was called the Bet Safar. So if you, if you, gra- if you memorize Leviticus by age six, you graduated to the Bet Safar. Now, because I want you to learn this, and, and science tells me if I get you to repeat it, you'll learn it even better. So with some go West Coast Eagles gusto. I want you to say the word Bet Safar. Let's do it together. Ready? Go. Bet Safar. Let's do that with a little bit more gusto. Let's try that again. Ready? Go. Bet Safar. Bet Safar just means the school of the book. It's, it lasted from 6 to 12. So from 6 to 12, you went to the Bet Safar, and in the Bet Safar, you would memorize the entire Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You had memorized the whole thing. At 12 years old, you had to prove you had memorized it. And here's how you would do it. You would sit with an expert. The expert would pick a passage at random. He would read the passage. And when he stopped, you had to pick it up word for word. When you proved you had memorized the entire Torah by the age of 12, that qualified you to take the Torah exam. Now, if you're thinking, hang on, if to even take the exam, you had to memorize the whole book, What could they possibly test you on? Glad you asked. The Torah exam was not based on your mastery of content. You had to master the content just to take the exam. The Torah exam was based on your ability to ask questions about the content in order to keep a conversation about God going. 
The greatness of rabbis was not known for their ability to answer questions and close the conversation, rather their ability to ask the right question to keep a conversation about God going. Think about your Bible. When Jesus was 12 years old, he was wowing the teachers of the law with his questions, not his answers, his questions. He was wowing them with his ability to keep a conversation about God going. Now, if you wowed the teachers of the law with your questions, you graduated to the next school. The next school was called the Bet Talmud. With that same amount of gusto, I want us to try that. It sounds like this, Bet Talmud. Ready? Go. Bet Talmud. Now, Bet Talmud just means the school of disciple or discipleship school. The Bet Talmud would last from 12 to 30. It was 18 years long and it was five stages. For the sake of time and relevance, we'll call the stages stage one, two, three, four, five. And the idea was, is if you graduate from stage one, you get to go to stage, two, yes, and then three and then four and, and then five. Now, at stage five, everybody graduates. Now, this lasted from 12 to 30. So if you've ever wondered why Jesus disappeared from 12 to 30, and then at 30, he comes out of the wilderness and everybody's going, Rabbi, 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 this is why. This is what was going on. Now, at stage five, everybody graduates. Everybody's now a rabbi. The only question is, is what kind of rabbi will you be? There were two kinds of rabbis. There were rabbis with authority and rabbis without authority. Now, a rabbi without authority was a rabbi just the same. And 99.9% .9 of all rabbis were a rabbi without authority. But once about every two or three generations, a rabbi would come along so special that they would give him a title, a rabbi with authority. Now, here was the difference. A rabbi without authority had to teach the Bible the same way his rabbi taught him. So the rabbi that mentored him for 18 years in the ways of scripture and in, in how to live life, a rabbi's way of teaching scripture was called that rabbi's yoke. So a rabbi would pass his yoke down, his summary statement of how to live life, what he bound and what he loosed, what he forbidden, what he allowed, things like this. And that rabbi would pass that down to the next generation. And if you graduated as a rabbi without authority, you were bound to teach the scripture the same way your rabbi taught you by passing on his yoke. But if you were a rabbi with authority, that gave you the right to make up your own yoke so that every yoke in Israel could be traced back to some rabbi with authority. Think of it as somebody having the right to start a movement or something, right? So you've got this kind of thing. Now, this is the most important word I'm gonna teach you today. Let me show it to you, next slide. The word is samika. Now, <clears throat> this is the word for authority in Hebrew. Samika. Now we're going to say that with a lot of gusto because it's really important. So ready? It sounds like this. Samika. Ready? Go. Samika. All right, let's try that again. Ready? Go. Samika. Now, if you want to sound Jewish, which of course you do, we have to add a little bit of a move at the end of it. The move is, all right? So let's practice that together. It just sounds like this. It's very easy to do. All right, ready? Okay, that was right, right, right. Okay, let's try this all more together. Ready? Oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. One person was late, that's okay. Ready? Let's try it one more time, ready? So, in Jewish culture, there were rabbis with Samika. Okay, more together. There was rabbis with Samika. And there were rabbis without Samika. Now, here's how they determined who had authority and who didn't. When you graduated from rabbi school, they baptized you. The reason is, is because they baptized you anytime you change social status. So think about your Bible. When Jesus was 30 years old, 30, he went out to the desert to be baptized. Now at your baptism, you had to have two verbal witnesses to your authority in order to be considered a rabbi with authority. Think about your Bible. When Jesus was 30 years old, he went out to the desert to be baptized by John. And John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world, whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Witness one, John baptizes Jesus. And Jesus comes up out of the water as a normal, regular rabbi without authority. 
until a second voice speaks. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And there was thunder and lightning and birds and rainbows. In other words, G the father was like, if no one else is going to speak up, I will. And Jesus walks up out of the water, not just as a regular rabbi, but as a rabbi with Samika. Which means he can make up his own yoke. <laughs> and Jesus spends the rest of his life wrecking everybody else's yoke. Think about your Bible. You do not teach as the other rabbis teach, but you teach as one with? Yes, it doesn't mean he was yelling. It meant he was saying something new and fresh. You have to have authority to teach something new. Yeah. Right? Think about your Bible. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The key to the phrase is the word my. For Jesus to say my yoke, he had to have authority. He had to have samika. And this is why the, Jesus' first sermon ever was called the Sermon on the Mount. Why? Because it was so well attended, he had to climb a mountain to create space. That's an amazing turnout for your first preach. I've been preaching for years and you're a right nice looking group of people, but I hardly have to climb a mountain to get away from you. What would possess people to come from everywhere to hear a guy's first sermon? Well, if there's a new rabbi with Samika and rumor has it, he's changing yokes up and his yoke is easier than the one you've been shackled to, people would have come from everywhere to hear this new rabbi speak. Now, the first thing a rabbi would do when he graduated is he would go get disciples because a rabbi not training the next generation is not doing his job. He's supposed to be mentoring the next group to take over. He's, so, he's supposed to be teaching them his yoke. But this, here's what would do. So, so the new rabbis would go and find disciples. Where would they find them? In the Bet-Tel Mid. Here's what they would do. They would go to the Bet-Tel Mid and they would find pre-vetted 12-year-old boys. Here's what they already knew. They've memorized the Bible, memorized it, word for word. They, they're, they're smart, they're disciplined, they're determined, they're passionate, right? They didn't have to question their intelligence, right? They didn't have to do anything. The new rabbis would have these pre-vetted 12-year-old boys. And here's all the, the new rabbi would do. He would walk into the Bet Talmud and he would look. And the only question he would ask is, do I believe he can do greater things than me? And if the rabbi believed that the student could do greater things than him, he would ordain him into his rabbi school with two words, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. Every Hebrew boy longed to hear the words of a rabbi say, follow me. But most of them only ever heard, I'm sorry, you don't have what it takes to be a rabbi. Go back and earn a living at your family trade. But this rabbi, he doesn't go to the Bet Talmud to find his disciples. He goes to the banks of a lake and he finds some fishermen. Hang on, if they're fishermen, what does that mean? It means they've been disqualified. And Jesus, the new rabbi with Samika, stands on the banks of that lake and says, Simon, Andrew, follow me. And they're jumping out of boats for the opportunity. That is the yoke of our rabbi. The yoke of our rabbi qualifies disqualified people. And aren't you glad? Because somebody would have disqualified me and somebody would have disqualified you. Oh, think about it. Think about it, right? Think about it. First four disciples, what was their job? Fisherman. Fifth disciple, what was his job? Tax collector. Hang on. Where'd he find him? At the lake. Hold on. If you're the tax collector at the lake, who have you been taxing? Fisherman. In other words, we're going to find out right now if you four have what it takes to follow me. Can you forgive the guy that's been robbing from you for years and let's go change the world? That is the yoke of our rabbi. First thing a rabbi would do once he got his disciples is he would teach them how to walk. They literally had walking training, right? Remember Jesus said, how will the world know you're my disciple unless you're walking like I taught you to walk? Like if, if we're not living how our rabbi taught us to live, how does the world know anything about Jesus? See, see we, we, people say, oh, unfortunately they rejected Jesus. N normally not. I don't know that I've ever met anybody that rejected the actual Jesus. Um, what, normally what people reject is people reject the image of Jesus presented to them. And, and normally what happens is, is we add our own yoke to his and call it him and it's just not appropriate, right? So, so here's what they do. They would do literal walking training. 
Jewish historians say you could always tell which disciples belonged to which rabbi because you could tell by how they walked. They even wanted to walk with the idiosyncrasy. They even wanted to walk with the idiosyncrasy of their rabbi, right? And here's what they would do. You could always tell who the best student of the day was. The best student of the day was the line leader, just like today. If you were the best student of the day, you got rewarded by being the line leader. And you could always tell who that was because the rabbis wore these special shoes that would throw up dust and dirt. And you would always tell who the one following the closest behind the rabbi was because he was the one covered in dust from his waist down. But this was not dust you wanted to wash off. This was dust you wanted to show off. It was an honor to be covered in the dust of your rabbi. So you would go back to synagogue or temple and you'd be like, hey, check out my dust, right? This was an amazing thing, right? It was an amazing thing. And it, remember, there's this one time, Jesus says, hey, if you ever go to a place and they don't accept you, just shake the dust off your feet. But, but hang on, this is the same guy that said, love your enemies and bless those who despitefully use you. How do those things go together? Unless the dust is a blessing, and it is. In, in the first century, to be covered in the dust of your rabbi was an honor. It was an honor. Essentially, Jesus says, even if someone's mean and doesn't accept you, still give them the greatest blessing you can possibly do, even if it's simply the dust off your feet. That is the yoke of our rabbi. Here's the thing. We'll either be covered in the dust of our rabbi, or we'll be covered in the dust of our own issues the dust of our mom, the dust of our dad, the dust of our denomination, or my personal favorite, the dust of that's just how I was always taught, as if that's gonna stand the test of time. We don't wanna be covered in those things because if we're covered in those things, that's what we'll cover others in. What the hope for the world is people being covered in the dust of our rabbi, Jesus Christ, right? Which leads me to this question. Unless you've been given special samika, and yuck. Okay, unless you've been given special Samika, and you haven't, then you are bound to live and teach the yoke of your rabbi if you call yourself a follower of Jesus. How will the world know that we're followers of Jesus if we change his yoke? Which leads me to this question. Have we taken liberties in changing his yoke that we don't have? Like, I love the yoke of our rabbi. This is one time. There was this lady <laughs> and she was caught in the act of adultery, like in the act, like in the act, right? Now look, that is bad. That, that, they would be embarrassing to be caught in that act if it was appropriate, because it's not a great spectator sport. But to be caught in the act of adultery, now you guys know your Bible, right? What does the Bible clearly say you have to do to someone caught in the act of adultery? You must stone her. There was a verse for this, right? You must stone her. So they bring her to Jesus. Now think through it. Why do they need Jesus? They need someone with authority. Yes, yes, and they're trying to trick him. And they're trying to trap him because he's being real loving and kind and, and gracious, you know? And they say, hey, Jesus, the Torah says stone her. We have a verse. What's your yoke say? Now Jesus is in a conundrum, isn't he? Does Jesus want to stone the lady? No way. Is Jesus supposed to fulfill the law? Yeah. So what's he do? He's a genius. Here's what he does. He says, you're right. The Torah says stoner. So I say stoner. There, I've kept the Torah. But wait a minute, I have Samika, which means I can make up my own yoke. The Torah says stoner, so my yoke says stoner. But my yoke also says you can't throw stones unless you're perfect. And it says, everybody gets tired of holding their stones. And Jesus says nothing except right in the dirt. What's he saying? Na, 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 na. He says, after everybody left, he looks at the lady and he says, lady, just answer my question. Where are your accusers? Not what did you do? Don't tell me about it. Where are your accusers, lady? And she looks around and she says, they're not here. He says, good, then neither do I condemn you. Why? Because the Torah said you had to stone someone caught in the act of adultery. But the Torah also says that you have to have two witnesses to condemn somebody. Jesus couldn't make her sin go away. So he simply made the witnesses go away, which automatically declares a mistrial. That is the yoke of our rabbi. Which is why there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are 
in Christ. It's not that you don't sin. It's just there'll never be enough witnesses to condemn you, right? Which is so profound from Jesus. As followers of Jesus, please hear me now. Jesus had a choice. He could have been right about one verse in the Bible. He could have been, and he would have stoned her. If he wanted to be right about that one verse, he should have stoned her. But Jesus chose to do something more profound than that. He chose, instead of being right about one verse, he chose to fulfill all of Scripture. And to fulfill all of Scripture is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And in being right about one verse, we can destroy people. But if we choose to fulfill Scripture by simply treating others as we would want to be treated if we were them, we can do something more profound than being right. We can be kind and we can fulfill the entirety of Scripture. And what upholds Scripture better? than fulfilling the entire thing. Think about it. If you were caught in adultery, how would you want to be treated? You'd want to be let off the hook and you'd want to be challenged to change your life. It's exactly what Jesus did. Then I do not condemn you. Now go and sin no. Right. See, what we do is we say it in reverse. We say, go and sin no more so God won't condemn you. What? No, no. We say, you better repent so God will be kind. You better get up, you better get up here. You better get up here and you better repent so God will be kind to you. What? No, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's two totally different things. Which leads me to this question. The yoke of our rabbi looked at someone caught in the act of adultery and said, I don't condemn you. Could our yoke do that? And if not, why not? And how will they know that we're followers of Jesus if we take liberties with his yoke? You, you know, the, the yoke of the denomination I grew up in, if someone committed adultery, they would announce it from the stage to embarrass them so that all might fear. It's not the yoke of our rabbi. It's the yoke of some jacked up white dude from 1880 with severe daddy issues. That is not the yoke of Jesus Christ. You know, I've heard Christians give people life sentences because of a mistake. It's not the yoke of our rabbi. And then those same people will say, well, unfortunately, they rejected Jesus. No, they didn't. They rejected the Jesus you just presented, which was actually your yoke. You're saying God, Jesus, Bible, but actually when you say God, you're just saying yourself with a giant megaphone, you're making a big giant version of your preference, right? No, no. You know, the yoke of our rabbi was active in the Old Testament too. It's almost like he was always in charge. Right? Like in, in the book of, it, I, was, I was being serious. The, 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 in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about the heroes of the faith, you know? By faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, by faith, David, right? By faith, Solomon. If you go read their stories, they were all messed up beyond all recognition. They were all making huge mistakes. By faith, Abraham, he gave his wife to Pharaoh's harem. If CNN and the internet would have been around back then, what would we be saying about Abraham? If Abraham was available to preach here next Sunday, would we welcome him or would we start an internet blog about their mistakes? It's not the yoke of our rabbi. By faith, Moses. Moses was a premeditated murderer. I looked this way and that and seeing no one, I killed the man and hit him in the sand. The problem was the next day the sand shifted. You got this leg sticking up out of the sand. God said, you'll do. I'll have you write the foundation of all scripture. You'll do. Temper problem and all, you'll do. You'll do, you'll do. Samson. Lost a bet and killed 30 people. <laughs> D David had 700 women. 700 women. And yet he still committed adultery and murder to get the one he shouldn't have. And do you know what? There are Christian denominations that according to their written bylaws would never let David stand on a stage and preach but they'll open a book David wrote, call it the word of God and fail to see the hypocrisy in that. By faith, Solomon. Solomon had a thousand women. A thousand women. God said, I'll have you write the book on wisdom. Surely you learned something. Imagine that conversation. Excuse me, sir. Are you the guy that successfully navigated the affections of a thousand women? Yes. You gotta be the smartest guy on earth. Let's write a book together. <laughs> Why do I say all that? I would say that to everybody here who feels they've done something that disqualifies them, the yoke of our rabbi has always qualified the disqualified. 
There's this one time, there's this guy named Zacchaeus. He's evidently short. He's up a tree to see what he could see. <laughs> He's thousands of people. And Jesus stops the thousands to talk to the one guy that everybody hated. And he says, hey man, I'd rather eat with you than them. And it says Zacchaeus was so moved by his compassion that he said, hey, I'll give half of what I have to the poor. And Jesus says, that's it. Salvation has come to this house. <laughs> is Jesus allowed to do that? Okay, okay, if I ask you if Jesus is allowed to do something, the answer is yes. All right, so let's try that again. Is Jesus allowed to do that? Yes. <laughs> Can you get saved without a temple visit, a sacrifice, a sinner's prayer, an altar call? Can you, can you get saved? See, see what, was, what was the only way to be saved in the first century? Temple ritual. Who's not allowed in the temple? Tax collectors. So Jesus circumvents the entire system of oppressive power and he sees his heart change. And he says, you know what? In my yoke, heart change counts. Heart change over ritual. Heart change, I desire mercy, not justice. That's the yoke of our rabbi. Uh -huh. Oh gosh, I, I, I could talk about the yoke of our rabbi till way, till tonight's service, but you'll get hungry and turn on me like a bunch of rabid dogs, I know. So I want to tell two more stories, um, one from the Bible and one from my personal life to sort of illustrate what we're, what we're talking about here. Th there's this one time. It says, and it's a two-line sentence, it says, and Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. Real easy to read over. And Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. Okay, a couple things on this. First, from where Jesus lived to Caesarea Philippi today is an hour and 20 minutes in a car on a paved road, Okay. This wasn't something, this was a couple day walk. This wasn't something you just moseyed on. We just happened to pass by Caesarea Philippi. You had to purposely go there. That's first. Second, Caesarea Philippi was the place no Christian would ever go. It was a cesspool. It was terrible. It was debauchery on speed. Whatever the worst thing going on in Perth tonight is, is Nickelodeon compared to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is, is Vegas times 100. It is horrendous. And here's why. Caesarea Philippi was the headquarters of the worship of the goat god Pan. Actually, today, Caesarea Philippi is no longer called Caesarea Philippi. It's called Panaya, the city of Pan, even to this day. It was the headquarters of the worship of the goat god Pan. And I don't want to be graphic. I don't want to be dirty or crass, but I do want to be historically accurate. Okay? The goat god Pan, he was a goat, and he received worship through public intimate acts with goats. So I'll just leave it like that, okay? He received worship through this public expression of a fertility ritual with goats, okay? And you're going, man, Jesus took his youth group there on a missions trip. I would have been fired for sure. I, I went there, when I went and studied with the historian, I went there and um, I took a picture of where Jesus was, would have been standing. Let me, let me show you this picture. That's Caesarea Philippi. Um, the, the reason that picture is of such high quality is because I took it myself. <laughs> Photographers everywhere trying to get people's arms in their photos. I did it. Get you some of that. Now, that's about a 200, 250 foot straight up rock face there. If you could see over to the left, there's obviously an open cave, a big open cave. That was called the entrance and exit to hell. They believe that was the, in, the doorway to hell. And then right next to that is the ruins of the temple of Pan. That's, that's where Pan was worshiped and, and sacrificed to and, and honored and this kind of stuff. And next to that is a flat platform. And it, it's, you guys, you can read into this. It's called the Court of Pan and the Nymphs. So a, a nympho, right? So this kind of thing is going on in the public street 24 seven, and here's why. The people of Caesarea Philippi were told if you don't worship Pan properly by debasing yourself, Pan will open the doorway to hell and swallow you into it. So it's not like they liked it, they just thought they had to do it so that they wouldn't get swallowed into hell. Now, Jesus walks into this situation with 12 men. Can you imagine what was going on in their heads? It would have been unbelievable. The debauchery would have been unthinkable. So much so that Jesus has to focus Peter, remember? He's like, hey, Peter, hey, right here, bro. Right here. Who do you say that I am? Peter shakes it off. He's like, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. 
Jesus says, that's right. And upon this rock, we'll build a church and not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. Jesus went into that cesspool of debauchery and he doesn't even bring their sin up. He doesn't condemn them for it. He doesn't threaten them with hell. That's why they were acting that way in the first place. He goes in and he attacks the power behind it. He says, you're acting like that because you're scared of this. And Jesus stands over the gates of hell and says, bring it on. That is the yoke of our rabbi. I used to kickbox. Um, I was quite good at it. I won the Southeastern Regionals in America two years in a row. I qualified for the US Open. I placed high enough in the US Open um, to qualify for the NASCA World Championships. Um, it's, you know, if it wasn't for my knee, I'd have went. I'm just, all right, so um, um, I, I, um, back then I could fight. Now I'm 43, I'm in no interest in fight now. It hurts too bad to get hit, takes too long to heal. And fighting's different. When I fought, um, it was kickboxing, so you, had, you stood up and if you clenched, a ref would break you. Now they take you to the ground, pull your arm off. I'm not interested, here's the thing. So my mom was one of those moms that was quite proud of me. In like an over the top way, you know? Like, like my mom was really proud of me and it embarrassed me, but you love it. You know, it's one of those things. And in my house, there was a room in my house dedicated, it was like a shrine to my trophies, right? And I, I was embarrassed, but I loved it, you know? And um, all, all my friends from the neighborhood came over and they were looking at the footage of the US Open and looking at the trophies and um, we were having fun. So, so this guy in my neighborhood, he was a freak of nature. His name was Kenneth Brown. Now, Kenneth Brown was a freak. He, I, I'm six foot two. 85 kilos today. He was six foot two, 95 kilos in the eighth grade. Like he was one of these guys when we were in elementary school together, like we're 10, he had to like shave before recess, okay? He's one of these guys, you know? And he shows up, come to think of it, he might've failed three times or something, I don't know, but he was huge. And he shows up and he says, Shane Willard, I think I can whoop you. I looked at him and I said, I think you're right. He said, no, I'm serious. I want to fight. I said, no, I'm serious. I'm not fighting you. You're twice my size. You don't fight people twice your size. It's a rule, right? He said, I bought boxing gloves to prove I could beat you. I said, wait, hold, boxing gloves. You mean we're going to put our hand in a mitt? You can't grab me. You can't take me to the ground. We're going to stand up and box? He goes, yeah. I said, oh, you should have said that. You said fight. I thought you meant, I thought you meant, okay, no, you mean a boxing match. Oh, we'll do that. We'll do that. That's no problem. So all the friends go outside. You can picture this, you know, fight, 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 fight. They're making a ring, you know. And I got in the ring with Kenneth Brown and I beat him to death. I was fast. He was slow. I was skilled. He was not. I, was, I couldn't hurt him. He's twice my size. I was just in and out, just pop, 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 pop. Frustrating him, you know. He got mad. Got a little frustrated, you know, and he thought, I'm going to end this with one punch. And he threw a right cross. It's unlike any right cross I've ever seen in my life. Let me, let me show it to you in real speed. This is how fast it come at me. I actually had time to think. I'll move now. When he finished throwing the punch, he left himself in this position. Let me show you this. And never before nor since have I ever hit a human being this hard. It's a perfect shot. If you understand striking, it's called striking from the ground up. Like big muscles, lead, not, no, no, uh -uh. big muscles leading small muscles, everything compact. Just, just, I mean, right on the, I, on, never in my life have I hit a human being this hard. Right on the base of his chin too. Bam! His head snapped back. His knees buckled. In retrospect, I should have kept hitting him but I'd never hit anybody that hard in my life. So I sort of stood over him and waited for him to fall. And he didn't. He stumbled back, caught his balance. He looked up at me and now he was mad. His face turned red and he said, boy, is that all you got? 
And it was. <laughs> How many of you know when you hit someone with your best shot and they're still coming, you lose. I forfeited to Kenneth Brown, admitted he was better and walked out the ring. You know, you know what Paul says? Paul says that the yoke of our rabbi was put on public display at the cross. Oh, forgive everybody. Oh, bless those who despitefully use you. Oh, blessed are the merciful. They'll obtain. Oh, can you do that with 39 lashes? Huh? How about some mocking, some scourging, some hitting, some spitting? How about a crown of thorns? Huh? huh? How about some nails in your hands? Huh? How, about, how about the inability to breathe? How about that? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Smite us, smite us. If you smite us, you'll break your yoke. You'll lose your moral authority for all time. You say forgive everybody, then forgive us. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And they beat him 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 and he kept loving and forgiving and loving and forgiving and loving and forgiving and loving for him even so to the point that the guy next to him says please remember me and in Jesus' dying breath he's still thinking about other people that's the yoke of our rabbi which is why any message that says oh if you do something bad Jesus is going to like Pah! that is not the yoke of our rabbi I don't care if there's a 25 foot cross over the top of the building the yoke of our rabbi kept loving and forgiving and loving and forgiving and loving and forgiving and loving and forgiving. You can't do more to a guy than kill him. He died. If you'll humor me for a second, here's what I think happened. I think Jesus descended into hell and he looked Satan right in the eye and he said, boy, is that all you got? Was that your best shot? You thought you could destroy my yoke by killing me? No. No, 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 no. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to be in here three days. And just to annoy you, I'm going to preach the whole time, right? <laughs> you know, Peter says that when Jesus was in hell, he preached to the dead. Huh? I don't know. It also says when Jesus rose from the dead, tombs everywhere emptied. <laughs> I wonder where they came from. Anyway, so Jesus, you know, I, was, that, was that all you got? You thought you could destroy my, my yoke by killing me? Oh, no. I'm just keep loving and forgiving. And you know what? In three days, I'm going to walk out of here. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cook breakfast on the beach for the very person who denied me in my time of need. That's what I'm going to do. And you know what else I'm going to do? I'm not even going to bring his failure up because he'd be, he'd be fearing that. I'm going to treat him how I'd want to be treated. I'm not going to put his failure in front of him. I'm going to ask him if he still loves me after all this. And if he still loves me after all this, we're going to change the world. That is the yoke of our rabbi. So let's stop for a second and let's give this some thought. If we could quiet the white noise of our week. I want you to pray this prayer underneath your breath. Lord Jesus, give me the courage to see things different. The irresistible urge to respond to what I see. If you're serious, I want you to pray this prayer underneath your breath. Lord Jesus, would you reveal to me now where I've changed your yoke? Where have I taken liberties with your yoke that I'm not allowed to do? Is there anyone that's not following Jesus because I presented an awful yoke? Would you please forgive me for changing your yoke? I have no right. <clears throat> I want you to pray this prayer underneath your breath. Holy Spirit, would you speak to me about someone that I need to cook breakfast on the beach for? Who's hurt me? Where do I need to let it go and show them love without even bringing the failure up? Is there a text or an email or a coffee that needs to be had with somebody that used to go here who feels weird about coming back because they made a mistake? Maybe we need to call that person and say, hey, Kingdom City is a place of fresh starts, second chances, clean slates, and the opportunity to write a better story. Maybe you're here today and you need to trust Jesus for the first time. Let me tell you what that looks like. It means you're choosing to trust Jesus' version of your life story instead of the one you've been writing on your own. Maybe you can make that decision today. So, Lord, would you let this place be a dwelling place for your name, the compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, God. Would you look this way? Thank you so much for letting me be part of your weekend. Um, I'd like to take a second again and invite you back tonight.
I promise it'll change your life. I also bless you to be people who understand that you serve a God that believes in you more than you believe in him. That he believes you could do greater things than him. I bless you to be people who understand that Christianity is not about going to heaven when we die. It's about saying yes to the infinite possibilities of a life that Jesus taught us to live here, now, today. I bless you to be people who understand that he has entrusted you with his yoke. And his yoke is the only hope for Perth, Australia, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and ultimately the world. I bless you to be people who know that deep inside. I hope Jesus got bigger, the cross worked better, the resurrection is central, hope scriptures got bigger, not smaller, but more than anything, more than anything at all, may each and every one of you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Grace and peace, everybody. God bless.